Oi. What I want to do, John, is I'm going to start right where I'm really interested and we can work back to where it's slightly less interesting if that's possible. Okay. I'm curious to know how, when you, when you work up to a conviction level on, on one of your uh, uh, most exciting ideas, how do, you, how do you conceptualize with your team and how do you think about sizing a position and how do you really make things, quote, count? What's a large position for you in percentage of your fund? I realize you have uh, your kind of master fund and then you have some highly concentrated best ideas funds mm -hmm. from talking to you before but mm -hmm. say in your in your primary vehicle how do you how do you think about sizing both long and short kind of best mm -hmm. ideas yeah um okay so we have three different vehicles one is best ideas where the size of the position could go up to 30 percent mm -hmm. um right um so that that has happened several times, but it's because I sized something at under 10 and it grew and it was able to grow. Um, and then um, the other two funds are managed with a certain vol, you know, mandate. One is 10 to 15 percent. The other is six to eight. So with that, in the, when you get into the six to eight world, you're really talking about um, thinking about it in terms of volatility before mm. you think it in terms of return. Mm. Uh, and I think, like, I like to say that, you know, there are, three, there are three disciplines of investing. There's macro, there's bottom up, which is the American, you know, fundamental stock picker world. And then there's quant, which is really a, a model driven risk management enhanced understanding about uh, volatility and a much greater discipline in portfolio construction, risk, you know, what could happen without having a clue it really as to what the macro or bottom up is. Um, so I hired someone in 07 who was a quant. Um, and I thought quants actually started making markets different in 06. I, I just thought they started trading differently, a lot more noise. And quants had really grown from uh, 2000 into 2007, being long value, short growth. Worked every year into that. Anyway, the point is, how I understand this is really is more nuanced and developed because I've now spent a lot of time just on non-macro, non-fundamental yeah. risk understandings. And it's actually changed how I invest. So now when I think about sizing a position, <clears throat> I think about it in the traditional ways of what, what things are happening in the world that's driving, let's say, the macro, my macro view, mm. and then bottom up what my risk-reward assessment is. But as... It, potentially as important or most important is what will happen to this kind of, you know, security in this kind of regime that I think we'll, we'll be in. Mm. And obviously you learn these lessons of like owning small caps in a bear market, you know, or, or right now how commodity equities are trading in a, in a downdraft a deflationary, you know, move. Mm -hmm. um, but ex ante, you can filter out a lot of these things, illiquidity, et cetera. Um, so all those things go into it, but <clears throat> I think what I've learned also is that portfolio construction of, of being diversified is not, is, is, can be a real benefit to holding these positions too, because when things don't share common characteristics, they'll move in different ways. Mm. And a lot of, a lot of investing now with short duration capital is the art of holding positions, you know, hedging, holding positions if you can because so much of what happens to price is simply liquidity moving around. It's not providing a lot of signal. It's a lot of noise. Um, and, and then, of course, you manage that according to your duration and expectations of your investors. So the answer could be like VIP shops is, was our best um, equity. It's a Chinese e-commerce maker. It came yeah. public in late 11 when nobody wanted to touch a Chinese you know, equity. And we bought it in early 2013 at like $28, 30 um, I sized it at six or seven percent in special opportunities. I sized it at one or two in global. Mm. I still didn't know a lot of things, but I was confident that new China and growth stocks were going to do well. And the thing went up to 225. Right. Amazing. And right, so it went from six and or you seven. You held on the whole way. Or did well, you... I did, and it got to 30 percent in special opportunities, and I had to cut it. Um, and I did a couple of months ago. In global, 
it's now a 6% position and I've traded around it a little bit more. I'm, try, I'm trying to hold it, but these Chinese internet companies are the most volatile securities that we deal with. Mm -hmm. Not because there's really doubt about what's going on, but the, but the variety of things, the nature of it, it's Chinese, uh, the uncertainty. I, like I believe that uh, you know, things that have never happened before are what is how you make real money. Mm. Most people think in a regression of the mean way. They, they, they look backwards, extrapolate forwards, and that's what happens 90% of the time, but the signal events, the big things, the things that affect other prices are things that were not on the model, haven't happened before. Yeah. So when I'm considering that, I'm trying to consider no matter how good an idea you, it could do, I mean, I, what I've experienced is being ahead of a lot of trends and- And ahead means wrong for a while. Well, it, yeah, it, it could be, but also when you're dealing with things that have never happened before, there's yeah. a level of uncertainty yeah. because it's never happened before. You can't model you can't model it, and so all you can really do is understand um, the risk reward of a of the f sort of fertility of the potential of the direction of the magnitude, and so I try to develop a sense of how the world is changing because again I think people they they don't know how to make sense of chaos and. It's like you know, addressing the complexity of the world. You could say, well, there must be a God because only a God could you know, understand and create and, and, and weave all this complexity together mm -hmm. as opposed to a Darwinian you know, manifestation of, of uh, all kinds of factors that are hard to understand. Um, and so I think people are inherently, I think it's unarbitrageable, they're inherently unable to really understand change. So when you think you're investing in something that is not a regression of the mean, you know, goes up to this price to book, then down to that price to book, or whatever. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty, and price is not the proper discounting of this new thing. It is merely a reflection of current liquidity. Yeah. Yep. So, so then the question is sizing according to what you think may happen relative to, with some duration, the risk reward of mm -hmm. what could happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the thing is, if you have a lot of the same bets, then you're, you're increasing your risk dramatically mm -hmm. with short duration capital, no matter how right you are, because they can go up massively and then down massively. Yeah. And the human instinct is to give you more money if it goes up and take it away if you've lost. Because they're trying to make sense of the world. We've all seen that. Exactly, and that's just the way it works. So um, it's a really great question, but, but there's definitely a tempering there's a there's a recognition of it's like you're 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 a cook you're preparing a dish for a certain kind of audience to mm. how pleasing the, you know it'll be not only today but like almost every day what combination of other things needed to be there for them to digest it and different people have different you know tolerances and interests mm. um, but but the the main premise here though is that I say price is a liar meaning price is not telling you the predictive you know, what's going to happen very well, not nearly as well as people think. And so you have all this opportunity and all this risk inherent in the market not knowing what's going to happen. Mm. Um, and my proof point is, you know, did five years ago in 09, could you, did the world imagine today? It's like, no way. No. And in 2004, could they imagine 09? Not even close. I mean, the yeah. financial bubble was really just really, I, I, that's when I started started. feeling it. Yeah. In 99, could you imagine 04 where you're just about to go into the peak of the housing bubble, you know, in tech, like, so just work backwards every five years and you see 94, could you imagine 99? Like, no. No. So I, I would, would postulate that in 2014, you have no idea what 2019 is like. It will be extreme changes because liquidity doesn't, liquidity will have to change, positioning will change, facts will emerge, et cetera. And so the way I look at it is, is, is uh, don't overrate the market as to what it knows. Understand that what the market is is current liquidity, a balancing as many buyers and se as sellers. So understand that if you have some sort of edge relative to current liquidity, and if you have the right duration and the right, you know, to either tolerance or recipe for how to hold these things, yeah. you have an exceptional chance to, to, to make money. You also have an exceptional chance to lose money totally against macro or, or bottom up rationality purely because liquidity can go completely against you. Yeah. So 
I, I think this is, this is just the way it is. I don't think this is ever going to change. I want to ask you the question another way. Okay. In the last 10 years, in, in your Global Opportunities Fund, what was the biggest equity position you put on at cost? And, well, how, and how big have you ever let it go in, before you've trimmed it? So in Global, I've, I've had this a 10, you know, 10% um, limit. Um, and so we've used that. You and, have, okay. Yeah, we've used that in uh, the subprime trade, which you know, you and I didn't know each other when we, we did it. Right, was able to be so big because it was it was a an insurance. It was negative carry. It was a, yes, it was a negative carry. Yeah, and a hedge. Yeah, and the fact that it grew large, uh, it was it's funny. It was sort of unmodelable. Right. in the world of equities, because we had never done it. Right, yeah. it, it, it's so we were shorting it, bonds. It, it, yes, it could. It could. You st- your cost of carry was stayed the same, but the fluctuations of the you know returns, hmm. you know, fortunately, in a way that it, it it ended up took a long time to actually go off. But once it did, I remember it was two up months and then a little pullback, and then it was every month was you know in our favor. So it was actually very easy to hold if you could have. Held it. So your memory's <laughs> not perfect. It was two up months. Mm-hmm. It was January and February of 07 is when mm-hmm. it cracked, right? And then it was March, April, May, June. Okay. It was four oh, okay. kind of months coming almost 85% of the way back. And then July, that was it. Yeah. So it was, it was short, but it was. Well, I had an employee who, uh, who lost his marbles in June of 07 okay. after working really hard on this. And his risk tolerance was not there for it. Uh-huh. And uh, he, uh, we basically stopped him out because he was so nervous, and I right. was so, I was so confident. Right. But that's the that's the thing you have to make a decision of: is you liquidity do. right or wrong? Can right. it kill you, or is this just something you have to tolerate? And then is that the only thing in, in your book, or do you have other things? And right. how offsetting is it? And but when you go back to equities, your ten percent limit is, is that at cost, or is that at so, market so, value? So, well, so. Usually it's, it's a, a gui- market. Is it a guideline? It's a guideline. Yeah, I think it's we, a, we, we have carry a, guidelines. We have so. a certain period of time, you know, to 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 you know, remedy. Ch- yeah. Okay. I think I think having um, I have a big team. I have a lot of ideas. I'm trying to be diversified. Okay. Um, in in special opportunities, I can have a bigger position. Special I can put on a yeah. bigger than ten percent position. Yep. But I treat that fund as if it were my personal account. Like mm-hmm. I, I like to joke with people, like, you know. Do you know the vol on your you know personal account? Like, right. you know what's you know, like people have crazy sizings. You know, usually one large. You have a position. lot more risk tolerance. In your exactly, personal. and you and you don't have to advertise, and you, you digest it much much more easily. And right. So I try to run it like that. Even okay. though we could manage the risk, I'm purposely not managing the risk. Even though I have shorts, even though I will, but I want to have sizable positions because if you're right on sizable positions, that's how you actually mm-hmm. can do really well. But I know that if it's not expected by the market, the path isn't isn't linear, mm-hmm. and so you just have to understand how much you can tolerate. Yeah, you know. So thanks. That the next question I have for you is how do you how do you attract, um, hire and maintain kind of true talent, and what does true talent mean to you? It's a really good question. So I look at I look at high value added human capital as um, as, as needs to have an opt-in, it wants it needs to want to be there. Mm. You cannot contractually enforce, you know, good investment work on your. I mean, in a way, you kind of get there from a lawyer for various reasons, um, but it's hard to get that from an investment person. Mm. And because I value um, having the same person be that person for a long period of time, being the Whatever you call it best is different if it's in a snapshot right now versus how it'll be and what it'll feel like to work with that guy for five or ten years. Right. So, and the culture of your firm is really determined by the personalities and qualities Agreed. of individuals and then how they fit together. So, what I've tried to do is define areas, industries, sectors, things that are, I think, gaining relevance. Mm-hmm. And it could be for good reasons or bad. Yeah. And the way I look at time is that we all have the same amount of time. And the question is, how do I have parallel processing, you know, aligned parallel processing to, to make myself more informed, but to, to have some shortcuts. 
So what I, my methodology is to try to find people that I think I can have a relationship with, you might say, mm -hmm. and then to understand how to both teach, mentor, assist, and then co-invest, ideally. Ideally, you want someone who's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And we, what we do is we eventually give them, usually after three years, we give them a book to manage. Mm -hmm. After they've three years, you probably know a lot about industry if, if you're focused. Yeah. And then, and then you size that in a way where it can't kill you and you have risk management protocols where if they have drawdowns, whatever, you know, other people deal with it. But what I'm really trying to do is to find both, they have to handle the basic analysis and basic research and they're the ones on call to talk to management or to travel or to do whatever. You know, send an email, what is going on? They have to answer. Right. But ideally you want them to do you want to see their genius that has been unlocked from all this process? Mm -hmm. And when you get that, even one idea makes it a you know, very valuable thing. Yeah. I don't look at this as very competitive with the ego. I'm trying to figure out the right thing. Yeah. And so it's, what's hardest actually is to hire someone who's properly contrarian, like literally wired in a way where he doesn't believe what other people believe. Yeah. It's a hard thing to hire. Yeah. What we've done is we've it's hired- a hard thing to teach too. It is, it is. What we've done is we've hired MBAs uh, as interns. Uh, we have a usually an eight to ten person pool of interns yeah. who assist every our teams summer. every yeah, summer. We've talked about this. That's why I brought it up. Yeah. yeah, and then we, when you work with someone for three months, it's a lot different than a resume. Yeah, you work with someone three months, you have a pretty good idea. So, a lot of like my investing is. I have a humility in that I don't know. I have a hypothesis, an idea, a belief, yeah. but I try to get information. And a lot of this requires people. If price is a liar, then you can't trust the price on the screen very much. If it's not predictive, truly predictive of the future, it's, it's exactly about current liquidity, but not exactly about future price. So that's what I use these, these people. I try to cre create a relationship where they have a lot of incentive to be with us to do that job, and I try to put them in a place where they can succeed, although I let my teams hire those people. I don't hire them. Um, and then we work with it, and you get to know whether it's going to be somewhat successful or not. And in three years, they pretty much become experts in their space, or they realize the differences of what the market says and what they, they, they see, the arbitrage between, yep. right? Yep. And then when they get capital, then they change in a whole nother way because now they're living with their decisions as opposed to you living with their... Yes, it brings their emotions in. Exactly. And so what I then do is I try to size up what I think are the best ideas. So I've, we have a relationship over those f few years. Mm -hmm. They fit in our firm. And what I'm really looking for is best ideas as well as ongoing fill me in, you know. But they have to manage their own thing and manage, you know, the relationship with me and... That's what I, I think it's logical, but I actually also believe that I cannot make them stay. I cannot make them work hard. I cannot make them be good at this. Or want to be good. Yeah, and exactly. And so we don't, we like, we like, uh, I like giving people time. I, I, I think three years is like a cycle. It's not a full cycle, but it's a pretty good cycle. You're going to have downs and different kinds of markets. But uh, it, it's, it's worked pretty well. I think, I think. Other fun, successful fund managers are the Darwinian, you know, results, not always perfect, of many people having tried and a few having succeeded. Yeah. And so it can be more fruitful, you know, often to talk to, to others. On the other hand, they may not have the same incentives. They may not have the same hedges. They may not have the same timelines. They may not have, you know, whatever. Or cultures. Or cultures. So you have to, you know, understand how much you want to deal with some in New York. You know, they talk a lot to each other. They use each other's yeah. analysts, I think. Um, and in San Francisco... It may not be anomalous that you're in San Fran and I'm in Dallas. I agree. I think, I, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a real virtue. But you do need to create your own culture. And then it can be a very powerful thing. Yeah. Where there's like a centrifugal force of a recognition of you leave this, it's going to be hard to find something that has the, the stuff that you, you, know, you had there. It's kind of like a market university. We try to teach the ma you know, macro. They're responsible for their sector, therefore bottom up. And the quant has been a big, and risk has been a big thing for us the last six years. So I'm pretty confident that we're offering them a training in those three things that they're, not, they're just not going to get anywhere else. And also a freedom, and a freedom to develop mastery and a freedom to actually manage money. 
So there's no reason really for them to leave and start their fund. But if they do, and if that, that's just the way it is, then that's what happens. I can't stop them. And often I think if it's the right thing, then fine, then they should do it. So there's so much liquidity, you might say, for so many, so many things are actually going up or going down. I don't look at it as a restricted. But I will say that it's very lopsided. Really good people are incredibly productive and beneficial. Yeah. But they're not necessarily, you know, you, you having more of them as they sprout opportunities and maintain those, those things it's gives a you a better chance. Yeah. Of, it's a challenge, though. Yes, of, of like living through that cycle and having, you know, different expressions. Also, one person can say one thing that changes your view of everything, you know, particularly in a connected world like we're in, and it can be very valuable. It's hard. It's hard to do this job if you want to do it well because you have to pay attention. You have to be so vigilant and monitor and pay attention to so many things. So, turning to the other question of of. Having an imagination is a very underrated, important thing. So having a contrarian attitude could just be you're wired to not agree with people. Right. But having imagination about a, a feel, a gut sense of what could be that isn't now mm -hmm. is, is really important so to prepare for something that the price doesn't show you. Yeah. And yet, you know, the, the, my process of looking every five years, it, it is guaranteed that you have no idea. The market has no idea what five years is. It's, it is not this. It is something totally different. So the more someone can either provide you information that can help you formulate that, or for themselves in their sector, you know, have a different differentiated view. That's the differentiated view. Very, very powerful if you understand, if you can implement it. But it's hard to find those people. You know, it's hard to find those people who are who can do the work, who can be connected, who are actually can be can fit in your culture and can have that differentiated view that the market doesn't have, an expert, a real expert, can have that. But you know, it's a question of can you have that expert at the right time in your firm, and how long will that expert work with you? I don't know. As a, uh, as you're trying to be institutional and long lived, we've we've just tried to get these people who are bright, you know hardworking and we put them in a sector and they succeed or not but we want them to succeed and then we stay with them and I try to harvest what I can they get paid appropriate you know appropriately yeah. for what they contribute if I if I had to ask you if someone had to ask you today in the next 12 18 months I don't mean to be too short term mm -hmm. but where where do you think given all of your processes and where you are today and the way you're thinking today which is very different than the mm -hmm. way others think typically Mm -hmm. Not contrarian for contrarian's sake, which again, I don't like either. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I had to ask you 12 to 18 months from now, where is, where's kind of the, where are the top two opportunities um, in your portfolio, in your mind? Where do you think you're going to be able to really make the needle move? So I think, so in a macro sense, I think we have a deflationary event. Uh -huh. And then we have, so essentially unwinding the positioning from massive QE. That's weak dollar. Um, strong dollar? No, well, I mean, we're going to strong dollar, I believe. But, but I think, um, so I'm but expecting- I hope so, I'm long a, the dollar. Uh, yes, a deflationary move that uh, pulls down a lot of things that were, everything was brought up by QE. Right. And then a shakeout and a recognition of what's strength, what's you know, long lasting and what's not, what's marginal. Yep. Um, so it's possible it's possible that we don't have this deflationary thing, but the world's not that strong. And um, the dollar rising in of itself is deflationary. Yeah. Um, and QE lasted so long. See, if something happens for five years, people have positioned for that. That's just the reality. They, they don't go against that position for three years and last. Mm -hmm. There's not that much left. So I'd say that, um, I'd say that there'll be a test of all the positioning that that was established because QE was the most clear <laughs> determined thing and it just kept going and going. Wait, um, does, does that mean in the interest rate category or does that is that equity driven? So, is well, I mean, bonds? US investors, for instance, put a huge amount of money, a trillion something into bonds, mm -hmm. bond funds, and put $400 billion into EM funds and sold US stocks. That's what they did. Mm. So, it's not a stretch to say 
they pull money from EM funds and they put it into U.S. equities. But in the meanwhile, we may have a you know real correction because it's a it's a de deleveraging event because of the upset of of all this yeah. and liquidity is terrible. Yeah. So much worse than it was you know really in the two thousands. So getting from here to there will move price, you know, could move price meaningfully. Mm -hmm. And any kind of Fed tightening, um, I mean, there's so many different policies that are happening that are essentially tightening. Yeah. And also, I think the world's learned, I think it was learned in 11, that all that, that stimulus and all that QE is not going to make you grow, you know. It's definitely not going to make you grow jobs. Right. So, and that's a whole other thing. But China itself, I mean, their policy is, they're now serious about reform and they're they're slowing down old china they're slowing down old china it's a well, it was a political struggle but there's a design to do this and now i think they've got their teeth in it mm -hmm. um so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot you know there's a lot of opportunity here for an event that's not actually for the s p say or u.s equities it's not actually describing accurately the macro or the bottom up you know future for those but because in the world of connected liquidity in a world that's reducing liquidity a lot of you know what's the price that clears what's the where does liquidity have to get to clear so we just saw you know we just saw in october the makings of this and it reversed on job owning by fed officials mm -hmm. and you know we'll see how much it takes to have how much more dollar up how much more oil down how much more positioned off how much more not sell off of bonds but you know bonds up right yeah bonds I mean, up yields down anything that's that's against expectations and positioning is upsetting and causes people to contract mm. you know take off risk which means you know they're, they're really going the, the wrong way so are you positioned for this already or so, is this just a thought no this is i mean this is my belief i've been i've been waiting this year you know in a way over hedging because i thought the market would see kind of the way the taper comment by you know, Bernanke yep. set off and then went back to taper and it didn't matter. It's like it had digested it. Yeah. It literally waited until the very last very end. moments. Yeah. Did it have to do that? Well, other things actually happened at the same time. And who knows how much the Saudis doing what they're doing with oil. Yeah. And who knows, you know, speaking to, uh, to, to someone d downstairs about um, the negative rates that Europe is, is now, are now being passed on to clients of these banks mm -hmm. who are now ordering, you know, to sell euros and to sweep cash into dollars. dollars yeah. Who knows? Like, you know, literally the world is always different. It is always a set yeah. of variables that are, that are outside of your model. And so sometimes things come together, but the less liquidity is in the market and the less it's expected, the more price moves. And in this situation, price moving is probably going to be a negative for, for after five years of positioning for QE. And so I'm just, my imagine is, is, is do, it doesn't matter what the earnings are going to be or what's, what's true north here. Price is going south. Temporarily, yeah. it's possible um, to go a very different direction. Okay. So, so anyway, what, but I spent a lot of time trying to understand how, what's the probability of the world being different than the market expects? Because that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. how, how will it be and when will it be and, you know, what, what are the triggers? And you spent all this time trying to figure those things out. But... Uh, I've backed into, despite all the issues, the, how much of the problems that Americans have recognized. 2000, I remember when I started, the Americans were delusional. You know, they thought they owned the whole world. They thought everything was going to grow forever. You know, and then we had top of the market. We had the new 2000 election, which was an incredible event, right? No winner yep. for a month. Yep. Um, and then we've had a series of sort of travesties, you know, really by all forms of government. And now Americans recognize like it's not run very well, and <laughs> right they and they understand this like like kind of all the bad news is out, and there's been massive change, and so it's like uh, it's like a company that's had a it's doing a massive turnaround over a long period of time, but we're past the past Good the turn. point. Yeah. And as much as you can say here all the bad things about it, yeah. when you go to the competitors, <laughs> Europe, Japan, yeah. whatever, yeah. EM, we're like. My God, we're so primed to do really well. You're just telling me to just buy every anything with yield because it's well, all going lower. So, so, so I'm basically saying also that 
that um, GDP growth, so people are attracted to EM for this high GDP growth, but really simple GDP growth is overrated. Um, I mean, expanding plant, okay, the difference between Apple and Apple's, you know, Asian manufacturers, I mean, whose business would you rather own? You know, the ones who have to, you know, expand plant to, you know, very competitively make, you know, goods, or the one who designs it, markets it, harvest most of the profit. Right. But the GDP of the country that has the manufacturers will grow faster, but the yeah. risk they're it's taking- It's not very productive. GDP. Well, it's just, it's just, it deserves a lower multiple. It's yep. much riskier. But it gets, it gets a lower multiple. It's just like it Japan. does. It, 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 it does, but, but the point is, as the, you know, we get older, we have, we have different talents, skills, abilities, uh, ways of monetizing this, in a way you can think of the whole world or America has having grown tremendously. And a lot of the rest of the world has not grown that way. So EM is where America was, you know, 50 plus years ago, a lot of it. Yeah. I mean, they're in the, we need to grow by using cheap labor or building up plant right. and, you know, constructing a competitive reason for that. Um, whereas we're, we're way farther along just because of having a head start and having a lot of other policies that allow it. And so we, we've had now this wave of globalization because of China entering the world. Mm -hmm. That's a one-off, never going to happen again. And we've had, um, we've had uh, development of technology that's happening in a way that's very deflationary, I'd say. It's positively deflationary. Yep. Unless you're one of the workers being displaced. Yep. And, and you have all these people cyclically thinking the world's going to repeat what it did. This is the problem with the Fed. This is the problem with economists. And most, pe most model-driven people, they keep expecting the past to repeat. And so when there's, when there's different variables, the different hedge fund managers are trying to have a fuzzy model that constantly changes and part of it's always going to be fuzzy, you know, and you're using part information yeah. and part price. So when you, when you incorporate all of these thoughts, so I agree with many of the things you're saying, how do you position yourself for the next 12, 18 months? So I've, I've had this position for the last say six, seven months that I'm fully invested and fully hedged. So okay. because I don't know, I don't know this year <laughs> that it would do this right for yes. until September, it was doing it in that small caps sold off and growth stocks sold off, but the indices didn't. Yeah. Anything safe, you know, didn't. Yeah. And treasuries done really well. So it was possible to believe it, but it didn't happen this year. Maybe it would happen next year. That wouldn't have worked. There's, I think, one other thing is I think the crisis was so, was so positive in changing the delusions of America, mm. American business and boardrooms. It really changed the course of America, but it was overdue for it. Yeah. So now I look at, I'm so impressed with American companies and American business people. And I, I mean, I, yeah. and, and that's after spending you know, almost 20 years investing everywhere. Yeah. It's no contest. I yeah. mean, it's no contest. But when the top guy is delusional and misallocating capital or lazy, it's different than when they're, oh my God, I got to be top of my game. I got to be focused. Yeah. Yes. So, so I, have this, I have this view that most of the leading company, not all, but majority are in America okay. like of what are, what are going to do well. And it's an America that's well along in this reorganization. Expectations have been lowered. Yep. But American companies are going global in a way they didn't before the crisis. So I look at, I look at the S&P as sort of world beaters that were focused at home, that were a little delusional, and now, like, oh my God, like this is serious, and this is how I'm going to grow, and i got to do painful you know, harder things. I got to be smarter. And I look at the rest of the world as having reasons not to do go through that process yet, whether you're Japan or Europe or EM, where you just can't actually get the skills that manage them, et cetera. So, so fully invested means mostly long U.S. Yes. multinationals yes. And, and big. Well, it doesn't have to be, it could be leaders. It could be leaders US in leadership. It could be leaders in tech. It could okay. be leaders in in, in a lot of industries. And, and does hedged mean um, beta or alpha hedges? It means are both they, are those short global? things like emerging markets, short things like okay. commodity equities, different yeah. things short. Yeah. It's harder to short obviously bad companies because of all the hedge funds that are already short them and the correlations that happen. Um, but vol got so low that I decided in July to go to owning, owning uh, puts yeah. instead of waging war with a bunch of different small positions. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I rolled it 
twice and and that's helped it's helped this month but okay. but trying to formulate what's where is the leadership going to come from in a way i've said i've backed into something where i can now imagine the s&p trading more than 20 times earnings because i think if rates are low oh the God. dollar's strong yeah right you think about it as a as an investor yeah if you're losing on well, you're buying a dividend yield right well but well and those yields are higher you know i think i think the yields are so high relative to you know europe yeah. or, or japan yeah but um, but the, the closest model is the second half of the 90s is what I think can happen, where the U.S. is preeminent, large companies do extremely well, tech as well, but in a very qualitatively superior way to what tech was then. And I think the U.S. becomes the fascination of the world because in a way we did all these things that needed to be done, and then the corporations, the, 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 the stuff that they did, and the stuff they didn't do, is gonna, they're gonna monetize yeah. in the future. So, it's a lot of things just are a relative trade of what to be long and what to to short to take out your volatility and your risk. Yeah. In this case, with a rising dollar, a lot of things are gonna are not gonna work. A lot of mar marginal things are gonna fail. Um, I think you're gonna learn. Oh my God, that's not a good trade because of price showing you. But I think the best things have a chance of moving down in that liquidity crunch. And after that, when you think that's over, you want to buy. I think you want to buy basically the S and P, and you want to buy what you think are leading companies. The risk to take is more like tech or right. or, or, in, or biotech or, or even leading consumer, any change, anything that's leading change, that's causing a leading change is where I'd put, take my risk. And I don't think the SME is very risky. So you can take out a lot of that risk by shorting something else. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's my conclusion. Okay. I think the other thing is that where we are in technology is costs of technology have fallen so much. You know, we've never been in this position before. Uh, the whole idea of like big data, we've never actually been able to harness the amount of information or data. What we're gonna learn from process, being able to process it and using it is gonna be extraordinary. You know, the, the, the efficiencies are gonna be gained. So S&P has already got all time high margins, totally unexpected. People keep, kept thinking it was gonna revert lower. My expectation is the revenue growth is not going to be fantastic because GDP is not going to be fantastic. Yeah. Share is going to be gained. Margins have a chance of being higher than you think. And global share. Yes, yeah, so global share. Yeah. And with a with, a, well, a lot of the anything pure technology doesn't really care what the rate is. You know, yeah. it's either the best and really useful. Right. It's not dependent on the on the euro, or or dollar exchange rate. So I guess what I'm saying is I think I think the world is, has to change from one kind of growth to another. And just because there's QE, you know, buying of putting cash in people's hands, it doesn't actually, you know, cause this change. Right. A lot of the change is really about a displacement of something that's meaningful in the economy with something that's a lot more efficient, whether it's labor or it's CapEx or whatever. You know, yeah. Uber is a good example relative to what was there before. It's just a rearranging right. with information you know, combination that's really efficient for massive efficiency, but but a terrible thing for for cab drivers who haven't who don't change. So that's sort of happening more and more and more. Yeah. And I think in Silicon Valley, there's a winner take all um, reality. You know, the, pe people can compete for a niche that's evolving, and then someone wins it, and there's usually a number two. Uh, but there's no value for anyone else. Hmm. And I think barriers to competition keep coming down around the world. And they're gonna keep coming down. And with that, take Japan. If you're not willing to change at the rate that your competition is, you really have a lot more to lose than you used to. You don't have the same barriers. I think the upside <clears throat> on, on these leading companies where things are changing is higher than is expected. And I think what technology will deliver in margin, in opportunity, in reach, it's just, it's really hard to be linear you can't think linearly you got to think about what's going to merge and it's going to accrete to the, the the guys who cause it and the yeah. guys who can scale it before others so i have this view that that american companies are going to win more share than you expect because we change more we change earlier and i think that crisis was a fantastic thing yeah. actually because that because that was shared throughout the world but really in a share throughout america mm oh my God, we have to change. The persistence of rationality since the crisis has impressed me. I now think it's gonna go for a long time. And if the world doesn't grow that much, you're always in this, not crisis, but this is not easy mode. Yeah. So 
I, I end up having, a, I, I despair about Washington, but I'm, I've actually completely changed my view of, of, of what positive things are gonna happen in America. And having invested around the world, I know there's no competition, really. So fully invested, fully hedged, does that mean one-to-one? -one? Uh, and so it's- I'm trying to understand yeah, more granularly got it. How, how you truly position yourself. So like right now, like right now I'm 120% long I'm 60% short, but I have delta of puts that are maybe oh, they 50%. Oh, really come in. Okay. Yes, they're just a, they're like a little bit out of the money. Okay. I mean, close to close to in the money. And so if we if we really start falling, I go deeply. Yeah. I, I go deeply in the money, and I your deltas grow. Yeah. Yes. So that that was presented to me because the vol was so low, mm. and I thought this would happen by the time QE ended. Mm. I didn't realize what happened. You know. You know, for the big stuff none right of, at the none end. None of us did, yeah. But now I think positioning is so off, so long risk, um, so convinced that, you know, rates are going to go back up. Uh, don't really know what the dollar is going to do. You know, the move up, you could either look at the beginning of a huge move or it's going to come back down because, I don't know, Fed's going to do something else. A lot of these things matter, but I think people are positioned for something which is not going to continue. Mm. And so I think it'll be, it'll be powerful. Um, so I think you, you have this opportunity to be short a number of things that are actually riskier than the thing you're long. Uh -huh. And then in a risk off move, whether it's a commodity equity um, or small caps or whatever, you can, uh, you can do quite well. Um, but I'm being, uh, I'm, I've got a pretty good diversification. I'm in larger, larger to mid cap things, not, not many small cap. Um, I mean, I've, I have a few small caps which have just been driven down. <laughs> like I, I just stopped like buying them or thinking about them because I, I knew too. the price was wherever you know, wherever it was going to go. Wherever it was going to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that I I could say that I'm I, I could say that I'm probably too too higher gross. Usually my gross ends at two hundred, but the the predictability of how it's moved and knowing that I have this downside. Like if the market moved up or down a lot, I'd be fine because my puts either, you know, go away. Being short a lot of stock is where you can run into a, you know, real asymmetric problem. Yeah, problem. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, the, for, for me this year, I didn't, I didn't realize that the market would take down small caps as much after as being did. the same trade. Small caps and S&P, pretty much the same trade. Yeah. February, they started diverging. And growth stocks, which really took off April 13, finally, it was so impressive. They 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 rolled over, but not because they missed their numbers or there was oh, some yeah, big right. problem. It was sector. It was yeah, it was sector. risk aversion. Yeah. And the other thing that was hard to understand it was, EM stocks did very poorly into January and then rallied, yeah. um, along with uh, like like oil. Like yeah. uh, so, it was really weird to to see some some things that were happening that was risk off, but then something that should be going down but was going up. And I think that's because the dollar remained weak. Fed, because it wasn't perceived as hawkish, it was dovish, the dollar stayed weak, and EM, which is kind of the inverse of the dollar, rallied. Yeah. I think EM is a lot better off than it was, but I think it still gets destroyed yeah. in, this, in this world. That's interesting. And so when I think about 12060, and even though your deltas are coming in, you're still... But I got that put, that, that delta... Explodes. Yes. Because it's close to the money. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that that'll cover that it will cover you from uh, let's say a further liquidity trap or liquidity. Yes, I got um, Russell E. Liquidity um, gap. I mean, yeah. Yes. In fact, I actually want a bigger problem, bigger dislocation because because it will unhinge in a bad liquidity environment. It'll make people sell at prices that they really didn't imagine it, they would sell at. Right, right, right. And and the you know having those shorts or those puts will give me cash to monetize to buy them. And I'll be del getting delevered as it goes down, assuming I'm pretty balanced. Mm. So we we hired a guy. We we've done a lot in risk. We hired a guy from Barra to 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 just do our risk. We model all kinds of ways. Risk is always backward looking. Always. So it's you know you're, you're investing with how was it was different, and often some of the risk is different than you thought. But some things like what happens in de deleveraging or deflation are you know familiar now that we've been through a few of them. Yep. Um, and uh, and I think what's happened in the in the last few months, for instance, energy. Like I was long a lot of things in energy, and now I just want no part of energy. Yep. It's not because it went down. It's, 
I, uh, because of what Saudi can do, and, 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 but also energy is not going to do well, really, if dollar ri rallies, we have a deflationary yeah. event. And the so supply just, is what it is, yeah. Right, and, it's, and supply... We're in and, the same spot. Supply and oil, is, it's not exactly noble. There's so many different inputs from so many different places. It's, yeah. it's hard. You're, you're only getting a fraction of the, of the picture. So I've just decided, you know what? I'm not going to take that risk. And, and actually, if there is a tremendous liquidity event, then I'll look at that. Mm. Um, I mean, then, then I think there's going to be some exceptional things. There's going to be a lot of distress. Right? Well, it's, what so. I understand, yes, exactly. What I've understood about the high yield market, and I didn't quite understand that, that was helpful today, is um, it almost that guarantees that there's going to be a lot of distress. Yeah. Right? When it's a high yield event. If you're five times levered and your hedges roll off, you're going yeah. be in trouble. Because you were five times levered at $100 yes. with EBITDA, and now maybe you're nine times levered now and you don't know what you're going to do. So, right. And so when you have a stable price for a long time, this was, this was housing in... Uh, you just, you expect it. Housing in 07. And, but think about energy. 06. Energy for the last... Right. I mean, literally, even, even during the, there was a small energy panic during the crisis in, in 08 and then right back up. Yes, I mean it was it was real because everything was 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 a, was a panic. But yes, oil reversed up pretty good. Yeah, because probably because China did that stimulus. Yeah, but then every, of QE. everyone assumed we'd see hundred dollar, one hundred fifteen dollar Brent or hundred dollar yeah. WTI at, at infinitum, and now all of a sudden it's eighty and it's going lower, right. and no one knows how to deal with it. So right, so all these assumptions that were based on either China growth or QE weak dollar are going to be overturned. Yeah, and people need price to. To, to convince them. Agreed. That's what. That's just the way it works, yeah. you know? Yeah. So energy, I, I think, energy is actually a low value added thing. It's not, it's really about do you capture, you know, is the price high enough for you to put a lot of money into one little geography to capture a spread? Right. That's not like a high value added, that's, right. that's not creating a biotech drug, you know, right. or writing software. It's not that high value added, but it can be very profitable mm -hmm. under the right circumstances. So at the end of the day, you know, the worse off things are, the worse that thing is. So yeah. it really could be um, a, a, a distress. It could be something to buy, but particularly if it's a lower cost, you know, because everything to, has to be lower cost. Yeah. Yes, the marginal producers are going to be taken out. What we just saw was everything went down together yeah. and now they're starting to separate a little bit. Yeah. If, if oil goes down another 10 or $15, you know, all kinds of MLP funds and Blow energy up. funds and you know, high yield and a lot of a lot of yeah. things because this whole fracking thing was not even a concept four years ago for, for, for I think for the market. Then it became, oh my God, this is a revolution. It's going to be so good. Not really appreciating that the more it actually is a revolution is so good, it actually is excess supply that's going to bring down the price of oil right. in the long term, in which case only the low cost guys really win. Anyone high cost loses. This, that's the way it works in yeah. mining or and else. So I think we had this belief that Saudi and the world would keep, or, or terrorism or war would keep up price. And I think the Saudis are showing you, you should, you should check your assumptions. Yeah. And we're, you know, more than halfway down probably. But for all I know, the world's going to keep it down there because every, everybody who needs oil to, for revenues are going to fight for it. We, we, uh, I, we had the view that, that oil was likely to trend lower like the Ford curve said it was going to over time. We did not have the view that a small supply shock and a liquidity vacuum could send it down $20 really fast. And, uh, you know, uh, that's the kind of thought that normally we would actually consider to be a, a potential situation. So um, even, even original thinkers get caught in, uh, in, in this assimilation of groupthink. And, um, yeah. We and thought oil was going to be really weak, and it was for a month, yeah. <laughs> and then it rallied yeah. for five. Yeah, and then ISIS comes shows up, and suddenly, you know, you connect potential scarcity with higher prices. So, do you love do you love doing what we do um, as much today as you always have? Well, the first seven years, eight years, I did it because I decided I had to. This is what I was going to do, and I had to make it work. Mm -hmm. And I was willing to do whatever it took to make it work. Yeah. Actually, not many people have that um, come in with that uh, passion or determination. 
Huh. Yeah, that's what I found. I put all my savings in the fund, so it had to work. <laughs> I had that passion and fear well, all, all mixed in the cocktail. Well, when you burn your ships, you yeah. know, when you burn your ships psychologically, you're going to do what's required to make it work. That's exactly right. It's a very powerful thing. Yeah. You, 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 you learn. A lot of people it's do not want to start their start a fund or take that risk or or commit in a in a in a way. I, in an all in way. Yeah. Yeah. I looked at it as a, as sort of an existential question of what my life was, you know, what I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be challenging. I wanted to learn mm -hmm. a lot. I wanted to accomplish. I wanted to feel like I was accomplishing accomplishing something. So, um, in, in a way, I mean, everyone's wired differently. I actually discovered my hypothesis of being an investor started when I was 30. I had no idea I was going to do this. Mm. So I started looking for a job when I was 30. That was after one. you had taught? Yes, I taught. Yeah, I was 24 when I taught when English in China. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I realized that I connect to the world really well through this prism mm. because I actually get along with people very well. On the other hand, I don't agree with a lot of, you know, yeah. Of things, and I don't, and I dispute a lot of conventional wisdom and and uh, and practices, and 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 then, unlike being in a corporation where what you know doesn't necessarily mean advancement or or, or compensation or whatever, there was a good correlation between how much you could learn, you know, the pace at which you learned, what you'd realized you should learn, and then what you did with that that that, that knowledge. yeah that information yeah. that. It, cor it could correlate to your success. You're, you're both your the feedback loop is really good. Mm. In a corporation, it's not necessarily like that. Right. And so I discovered that this was actually this, I was wired for this kind of this kind of world. And I had a determination that I was going to do this. And you know, one thing led to another thing. It all looks everything looks backward looking. Everything looks like a oh yeah, the narrative is just so obvious. Yeah. You know. But going forward, it was. I think I realized that I needed. To, I needed and wanted to do something I was really interested in. And I, the more I, the, when I started doing this, I realized the monetization was all going to be in the distance. Mm -hmm. So it was like learn. You know, my first job, do it for at least two years. I worked for a thousand dollars a month. My first, I, I, I haven't had someone offer to work for, you know, nothing or. Yeah. It, I really wanted to do this, and yeah. the more it happened, the more. I worked for twelve hundred bucks a month. Did you? Yeah, I did. Well, so but but the, but there was a, there's an optionality. I, so I believe there's an optionality people don't really understand. Just the whole idea of optionality is 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 hard for people. In fact, until Black Scholes, the market didn't understand how to price optionality actually, and that was only 40 years ago. And even Black Scholes is flawed. Yeah, exactly. So so but optionality to me it means with your life is is it's important to actually pursue to put yourself in a position of things you're interested in yeah because the optionality around doing that's really high and you might as well get paid for it well right <laughs> but if you don't actually if you don't actually take the steps forward yeah uh to, to in, in what you're interested in you really have no idea you've predetermined what you think you're going to get from it oh for sure right and i, and I think yeah. and i think you need to actually pay some premium time expense whatever to learn and so a lot of what often getting to the right place is not saying I know it's gonna happen, it's saying this looks like a place I should be going That's towards. Right. And it might and it's likely to happen, but I'm gonna keep pushing. Yeah. Yes, and, and 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 employing someone is paying a premium to get closer, you might say, to learning right. about something or going on a trip or you know, or whatever, paying for research. It's paying a premium to put yourself in a position to have the option of making a good decision or a better decision. So I look at I look at my business as an organized way of parallel processing and paying premiums with non-expiring as best as I can people, mm -hmm. you know, who who will do, do this long long time. I definitely get better at it. On the other hand, you know, there are some markets that are fant you're wired fantastically for, and others you're just not. You're not. I, I mean, agree. you know, it's like I was really wired well for believing the U.S. was going to be in a bear market in 2000. And I was so convinced that I went looking for things that had peaked 20 years before. That was energy and shipping and mining, and I got involved in that. And, I, and then I got involved in India in 2003 and China. Like I was, it was like going off the grid. Like right. what? <laughs> How right. do I avoid the carnage? Right. And and I started learning about all these things, and that informed me so much about the world. About your thesis. And then China comes in the world, and suddenly that's the trade. It's so obvious. And the subprime trade for me was. What could blow up the China trade? And it was the 
the housing bubble and the financing bubble of the housing bubble. And so I actually, I never worked in an investment bank, but I could see it, the money coming from Asia and the rest of the world, keeping their currencies cheap in order to get healthy, yeah. was f basically fueling this. Wall Street basically took it and packaged it, yeah. you know, and basically sold, sold it back to them and everyone else. And, uh, and so that was my hedge, like, of, of being long these things. But also, U.S. was in a state of delusion, I yeah. think. Equity yeah. bubble, credit yeah. bubble, but now it's different. Well, now it's central bank divergence, and we, but, need, we need to understand this. Yes, yes, but we now have become not experts, but really smart collectively about, like, I didn't know what QE really meant in 09. I didn't know, you know, they could wield these powers, you know, like to make this, that, and the other thing happen. Yeah. I mean, um, but with time, the risk on, risk off period ended in 11, and beginning of 12 is when correlations, and this is things like I learned from these quants, correlations dropped a lot, mm -hmm. and suddenly you could be a stock breaker, you could do long short equity, you could do a lot of things. And in 2013 is when innovation started being priced. This is when growth stocks started separating from other things. So I, I, think, I think innovation will so dominate, like, change and innovation will so dominate the, the future. Policy, policy is not the story anymore. Right. It affects things short term, but this is really the end of our policy and the beginning of serious policy everywhere else. That's right. And the, do the dollar ra rallying will so overturn all these assumptions and marginal trades that are out there. And I believe in a greater winner take all approach, meaning being aligned with the winner, the leader, the, the, the larger one, or the, the one who's causing change is the safe trade. Even if it's not the way it was that's not what exactly happened. Yeah. That didn't happen in 2000, 2010. You know, 10. You know commodities and EM did well in that, in that period. Mm -hmm. S&P didn't do anything. So, you know, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's so interesting because when you're talking about the perceptions of the entire world and all the money, you know, of all, all the, yeah. in all the world and what it thinks versus yeah. what it actually happens it's a fascinating intellectual and practical exercise well, and you're you're a perfect person to do it and uh, <laughs> I, I i really appreciate you sitting here and being candid well, and, good, and, questions. And, and good questions and sharing sharing all those answers so thanks john okay thanks kyle